Okay, so the next speaker is Professor Greg Holman. So his talk is on the radio afterglow of GW170817. So let's welcome Professor Holman. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Okay, so thank you very much to the organizers for having me here today. Uh, I realize I'm the last speaker of a very long day and many of you are jet lagged. I'm certainly jet lagged, so I'll try to keep it on time. I'm here to talk about the radio afterglow of GW170817. I'm here on behalf on a very large group of astron radio astronomers primarily and theorists uh, using a wide range of facilities uh, in the discovery and monitoring of this afterglow, which uh, is still getting brighter to this day. So this is a work in progress. Um, starting off, I want to talk about um, what we might expect uh, for, for uh, radio afterglows uh, for an event like GW170817. I'm primar primarily focusing on three components. One, we've, we've heard in many talks today about the few percent of a solar mass of ejecta traveling at speeds varying from 0.2 to 0.8 C uh, that will interact with the ISM and shock the ISM and you will have a, a synchrotron afterglow uh, rising on timescales of months to years, which is dependent on the energy of the ejecta as well as the density of the certain binary uh, uh, medium. Secondly, it's long been uh, uh, theoretically speculated that the central engine of short gamma ray bursts are uh, potentially neutral star mergers, which of course implies that they launch relativistic jets. In the, in the case of a relativistic jet, it, you will have a, a, uh, a, a faster rise, and the, the time scales in this case is days to weeks, but it's also very strongly dependent on the viewing angle uh, towards your line of sight, uh, to, towards the uh, uh, axis of that jet. And the third possibility that I, 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 I'll be talking about a lot is uh, the case where uh, that jet does not escape cleanly and rather interacts with uh, some of the dynamic ejecta, uh, forming a cocoon. And I show two examples here, a weak and a strong cocoon. Uh, the strong cocoon is where the uh, jet dumps all its energy into that dynamic ejecta and does not escape. And the emission you see at radio is due to the uh, interaction of, that sh uh, of the shock break out of the cocoon with the ISM. And then the other possibility is when you have the jet burrowed through and you have uh, uh, only some of the energy of the jet dumped into the dynamic ejecta. And that gives you what we, what we call here as a weak cocoon. Okay, so we've got time scales of weeks to months, days to weeks, months to years. Uh, in the case of GW170817, we can't really uh, ask for uh, a number of large telescopes uh, to observe you know, every day for all those time scales. Happily, in the era of GW, multi semester astronomy, there was lots more contextual information to help us decide when to really uh, put our focus in the radio. Of course, there was a detection of gravitational waves, uh, the detection of a burst of gamma rays uh, soon after, and of course, the lovely uh, detection of uh, optical uh, UV and IOR uh, counterparts in the following day. And then nine days uh, uh, post-merger, we had an X-ray afterglow will show up, and then uh, a few weeks later, we had uh, a mid-infrared afterglow uh, component show up. For the radio, it was really the appearance of this X-ray afterglow. Uh, that motivated us to really become uh, more intensive in our efforts in radio because there have been lots of early time constraints with Chandra and Swift uh, on the presence of a uh, early time fading afterglow uh, that's, that confirmed that this was actually a rising component uh, which is consistent with a number of the models we showed in the previous slide and for which you expect a counterpart radio afterglow. So we really mobilized uh, very intensively after that detection using a range of telescopes Primarily the, the very large array in New Mexico, still the largest and most sensitive interferometer on the planet, uh, the GMRT in India, and the Compact Array in Australia. Uh, after a week of little sleep, we eventually got our first detection, uh, 16 days post-merger. Here I'm showing the Gemini South image with a detection of the NIR counterpart. Here's the UV uh, source from SWIFT, and here is uh, the barely visible radio counterpart found with a very large array. Uh, 16 days post merger. All, th these are all part of a, of a trio of papers submitted to science on the event. So uh, this was uh, co-located with the afterglow's uh, position, but what really kind of uh, reinforced for us that this wasn't indeed our afterglow was that over the following two weeks, it clearly evolved in flux density, uh, after which we had to stop observing and rapidly publish our paper in time for the October 17 deadline. Uh, so here's the light curve from the, from the first two weeks of observations. As you can see, at the time of detection, it really was very faint, uh, about 14, 15 microchansities, uh, which 
actually would have been impossible only a few years ago. The upgrade of the VLA in the last decade has made this kind of uh, sensitivity possible. And we can, of course, try to now fit various models to try to understand what, what component of the ejecta are we seeing producing that radio emission. Uh, we work very closely with the modeling team, consisting of Udina Kar, uh, Ken Hodokzaku is here, uh, Svi, of course, and Or Gutlieb. And there's a bunch of papers that I'd like to point, to point out as well, too, that really go into depth. Th these papers are both prior, meet soon after, and since uh, focus on the interpretation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the event. Very recently, uh, Odin Akar and Svi put out a really nice review of, of the X-ray and radio emission and, and the interpreting the afterglow uh, uh, based on results to date. Uh, <coughs> numerical models used have been previously published, but are also consistent with BoxFit. Box fit. I won't talk too much about this because Svi is talking tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll go through the modeling in depth. OK, <coughs> first I, I want to talk about is, is, is what we can uh, rule out with the early time uh, afterglow of, the, of, the, of this emission. And, and the first case we want to consider is the case of a non-axis afterglow, because of course there was a detection, as was discussed earlier on today, of a uh, uh, burst of gamma rays soon after the event. Uh, now in, in the context of the, of the bug population, the classical short GB population has, has already been mentioned, this was a very, very weak event. And one uh, possible explanation is that we're looking at a, a weak analog of a non-axis short GRB. And, uh, <coughs> The radio and X-ray data really uh, rules out that possibility because uh, you don't see the, the typical fading X-ray radio after you expect that scenario. And in fact, uh, there's been a, a discussion in the literature that if it was so low luminosity, that, that, that jet would not be able to actually break out. Um, so the, there, was a lot, and there was a lot of actual uh, observations with ALMA, the VLA, compact array, within the first 24 hours looking for uh, evidence for an off-axis jet, for, sorry, a non-axis jet. Another possibility to explain the very faint uh, gamma rays might be that you're viewing the jet slightly off axis. So you're only catching the edge of the jet. So within a few degrees. And that's where the radio really kind of played an important role because uh, you can try and fit models for that scenario to the radio, to the light curve. Uh, and and basing, you know, based on various uh, uh, model parameters, particularly the, the density, you can try and find out what's a good fit for the, for the radio light curve. And it became very clear very early on that no physically plausible model for ISM density could explain the radio light curve. In fact, the implication, the only fit you, you could have for a, an off -axis, or for a slightly off-axis jet implied a non-physically low density for the, for the uh, circumbinary uh, medium. So that was ruled out also. Um, and a lot of work has been done since that, since that trying to figure out uh, a, a coherent model to explain gamma rays, x-rays, radio, and so forth. And I'm going to talk now about what models did fit the early time uh, light curve. And uh, here I'm, look, I'm showing a number of models that, that, you know, we only had two weeks of data uh, initially. And what we, what we found were there, were there was a number of plausible models that fit the data. Um, uh, I'm showing here, uh, you can see three different light curves that have the same kind of rise, uh, rise rate. The, the, the flux is rising as T cubed. And that's just uh, examples of uh, spherical or quasi-spherical uh, outflows that includes, for example, uh, in, uh, in red here, uh, this is a, a, a strong cocoon. Uh, in black here, this is a low energy or uh, cocoon plus jet. Uh, the pink is the case of a fast or a high velocity tail for the uh, dynamic ejecta, uh, which was discussed earlier on by Shabbatasan. And the blue is the uh, example of an off-axis jet fit to the data, uh, a classical off-axis top hat jet. And uh, you can see that, that three of the, you know, the, uh, all these three light curves are kind of rising at the same rate. Only the, the uh, off-axis jet rises at a different rate. It has a faster rise and a flatter, flatter peak. Uh, and all these models were basically consistent with the data and all suggested very low uh, density environment. Um, other groups uh, similarly try to fit, mostly focusing on the case of an off-axis jet, uh, fit their light curves to the data also. Um, uh, one prediction that, that was, uh, I think, worth mentioning is the example of, a, uh, of the uh, uh, choked jet or the strong jet, uh, sorry, the choked jet or strong cocoon model. Uh, and this is actually a numerical model uh, uh, that actually tried to take the gamma ray data and explain it in the context of, of a choked jet uh, i.e. a strong cocoon, and predicted the radio light curve uh, uh, based on that model. And what you see here, it is actually rising at a much, uh, it's nowhere near as steep as the other light curve. It's actually be, 
because you, it, it implied a uh, velocity gradient for the data rather than a single velocity shell. And uh, this also made a predi prediction for, for what the, the radio light curve behavior would be going forward. So getting back to the original model I showed you, based on the early data, what could we say? Well, the answer was not much. All three models I showed earlier on were still consistent. But we had a framework for what we needed to do going forward to try to actually uh, answer these questions. And we have very different, a number of different ways to try to probe this. The light curve evolution, uh, we only had two weeks of data, uh, but we, we predicted that after about 100 days, we should get a good constraint on the ejecta morphology. Whether it's rising faster than T cubed, rising as T cubed, or rising slower than T cubed. Uh, the other, part, the other, the other uh, angle that, that we talked about was the fact that the size would also distinguish between dynamical ejecta and other models. So uh, uh, we can use techniques like VLBI to try to directly image and measure the size of the source. Polarization will also inform on the structure of the outflow. If there's, if there's a jet component present, that, that may have a higher degree of polarization, although you want to be observing polarization over a range of time periods to really be able to, to use that uh, strongly. And I also want to mention that, that, that separately, the X-ray observations can constrain uh, uh, between these models by just focusing on the, uh, the appearance of synchrotron cooling in the X-ray spectrum. So uh, after that initial uh, suite of observations, uh, we were able to continue observing for the, fo for the following uh, few months. Um, happily, the VLA and all the radio telescopes were not sun constrained, um, which meant we could continue observing throughout the, the, the following three months. The only thing I would say is around about here, um, the largest solar flare for a decade occurred. So this smiley face did not apply. It was uh, it, it, the actual flare itself affected observing. And more importantly, when the resulting CME, coronal mass ejection, hit the Earth's atmosphere, there was a, 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 a class G4 uh, geomagnetic storm that really made observ observations very difficult. Uh, but that aside, most of the time for the last few months, while other telescopes have been sun constrained, uh, the radio telescopes have soldiered on. And now I'm going to show what the data after that first, uh, the data since that first paper, uh, looks like, and it's, it basically shows a continuous rise uh, up to about 100 days. Uh, and this is what's published in Muli et al. 2018. Um, and now we can kind of, oh yeah, this is just showing the, the updated animated uh, GIF, which shows the continuing uh, increase in the brightness of the radio source. Uh, <clears throat> the data across the entire 100 days is very well fit by a single power law. Uh, with a special index of alpha is minus 0 0.061 and a temporal index of 0.78. So as you can see, definitely rising much slower than uh, T cubed. Uh, uh. And what was really nice is that we were, we, our paper came out just before the uh, Chandra became, uh, before the sun constraint kind of ended. And we made a prediction of what we thought the x-ray should be if it was indeed a single power law as expected. And it was, it was indeed consistent with the results that came out shortly afterwards. Uh, the radio only and the radio and X-ray spectral indexes are, are, are indeed uh, consistent. And a number of other, other groups have been publishing on that also. Uh, what about the mo what, looking back at the models I showed earlier on that were, that were uh, pre previously all consistent? Well, all those models are now ruled out. Uh, the the T-cubed rise and the uh, faster rise are all ruled out. This is rising as t proportional to 0.78. So all these models were ruled, ruled, ruled out. In particular, uh, a simple top pass off-axis jet model uh, was ruled out by the uh, radio light curve very clearly. Um, I'm going to show here again. This is the uh, model I showed earlier on from the paper by Gutlieb et al., which is based on the, uh, uh, G, uh, the gamma ray data numerical model in the gamma ray data, and they made a prediction of the radio light curve would look like, and in fact, that fits very well. Uh, and um, some additional modeling is shown here now for this data based on that concept. So it turns out that the data uh, can be modeled with a single one-dimensional uh, velocity profile, uh, where E greater than beta gamma is proportional to beta gamma to the minus five. Uh, and I'm showing, we, we show here just the two cases. One where it's a cocoon, and you've got maximum velocity with gamma of 3.5, and the other is the uh, tail of the dynamical ejecta, which is actually still can also fit the radio data. In this case, beta max is 0.8. Uh, the takeaway point from the second paper is that the data, the, the radio and x-ray light curves can be explained 
by uh, a wide angle outflow viewed on axis. Uh, and there's more energy in the slower moving ejector. That's the takeaway point. Um, here now is a, a, the list of possible models and where we are after that second radio paper. Um, well, like I said, we've ruled out the on-axis jet, clearly. Uh, slightly off-axis is also uh, ruled out. Uh, the, the, this possibility that's shown here is the possibility of a uh, off-axis jet uh, plus cocoon, uh, also referred to as a structured jet. Uh, in that case, we say it's less likely. Clearly, thus far, we have not seen any contribution, or we don't see clear evidence for contribution from an off-axis jet. Uh, so there are two possibilities. One, the jet is very weak, and it's just not very obvious in the light curve that it's present. The other possibility is that it's very, very strong, and it hasn't yet beamed in our direction. But the implication there is that the energy requirements are very, very large. Uh, something like a jet with energy greater than 10 to 52 ergs, uh, an isotropic equivalent energy, which means uh, it'd be uh, 1%, uh, of order 1% of gamma ray bursts, short gamma ray bursts that we know of have that kind of energy. Um, other groups have argued that they think that there's evidence for the jet and the light curve to date, uh, that you can kind of fit the light curve with uh, a cocoon that's kind of fading away and a jet that's kind of rising, and it adds up to a single power law uh, that includes uh, Lazari et al, Marguri et al. Um, <clears throat> the next possibility that we think is also less likely but not ruled out is the case of the dynamical ejected tail. Uh, as I showed, it fits the radio data. The only issue is that we say it's less likely because it doesn't explain the gamma ray data. You can, you, you can use compact, compactness arguments to demonstrate that the, the gamma rays required a gamma of at least 3.5. And what we think is most likely, based on the data to date, is that the, there was a jet launched, that it was choked, and the, the, what we're seeing is primarily just the radio and x-ray from that mildly, uh, uh, mildly realistic uh, outflow viewed on axis at all times since the radio and x-ray were detected. Um, going forward, how, how can we really distinguish between these three models? Uh, the possibility of a hidden jet we haven't seen thus far, uh, the possibility of the dynamical ejector, and, the, and what we think thus far is most likely, which is the choked jet and all the emission from the cocoon. Like I mentioned, uh, measuring the size and the polarization are the best angles we have right now to distinguish between these two. Um, I'm going to discuss just the case of the VLBI for now. So <clears throat> we can combine telescopes from across the world and make a mega telescope and uh, try to image the source with exquisite resolution. Uh, in this case, we take the VLBA, which is an array of antennas across the continental US and beyond, uh, spanning about 9,000 kilometers in baselines, giving you a resolution of order milli arc second. Uh, to boost sensitivity, we add in the uh, Green Bank Telescope, the largest uh, single steerable dish, and we throw in the VLA, giving us, giving, giving us 38 dishes with a collecting error about 2.5 times the VLA. And we've been observing, actually, uh, multiple epochs since about October to try to measure directly the size. Because that, that distinguishes between the case of the dynamical ejector, quite possibly, and the presence of a jet and the cocoon models. Uh, looking at very coarsely, we're, we're, we're arguing that that's more, more likely what the relative size would be, that the, that the uh, material traveling with a higher gamma will be larger in physical size. Um, but now, in, in a more uh, Carefully modeled sense, this is uh, some results that will be coming out. Uh, examples of how a cocoon and a jet will look uh, via VLBI. Uh, we're feeding that forward into our observations. Now, <coughs> we are, we're talking about observing with a resolution that's actually of order the same size. It's a, it's, this is actually an exaggeration. The, the beam size is about 1.4 milli arc seconds. You can see here. Um, so we have a very good shot of being able to constrain this with reasonable signal to noise. And what we're trying to do here is actually take these uh, nice uh, numerical models from uh, our, the theory group of what the appearance of these uh, ejecta will look like and actually feed that into our fitting of the VLBI data uh, uh, because we're actually using super resolution. We, we're trying to fit a, a, a source uh, that's typically of the same size or smaller than, than our resolution, but we can do so uh, as long as we've got good signal to noise, which we do have. So I would like to, I wish I was in the, in, in the position to be able to show you our results, they're not quite ready yet, but watch the space. We hope to have them ready very soon. Um, the hope is we'll, we'll get the very first snapshot image of the radio afterglow of a neutral star merger. Uh, it won't look like this, it'll look more like this, a nasty Gaussian that we'll be trying to fit, but uh, it should be, I think, pretty exciting when we get there. 
Looking forward, as we get to 03, of course, we're um, thankfully, I think we'll all agree that we're offline right now. Um, so we can digest GW 170817. But soon, in, 20, in, in late 2018, we're back online. LIGO's back online with, with three detectors. We hope to have good localizations, uh, especially if Virgo makes a detection, we could have a, a really good localizations. And um, with greater sensitivity that, we, that, we, that would be present for LIGO for, for 03, um, we expect to have uh, potentially a few NS mergers in 03, and maybe even as well the first NSBH merger. And we've been trying to prepare for that now with, with, our, with our planning for radio again and our large collaboration. And we've been trying to be able to understand what uh, role radio will play uh, depending on things like binary mass, mass ratio, the nature of the remnant. And I'm showing here very crudely with, without any quantitative data some of the scenarios that might take place. Uh, so in the case of GW170817, uh, there was a blue and red clonova. Maybe a three-component kilonova. There's a cocoon, we think. It's not uh, clear yet. Was there any evidence for a gamma ray burst seen from somewhere else in the universe? Uh, the data most favors a choke jet, but we don't know that for certain yet. But we can imagine scenarios where we have larger total mass, uh, where you may not have a blue component, where the search for a red, for a, for a red counterpart uh, will require more sensitivity. And it's not clear you definitely will have an optical counterpart. Um, of course, we may have the first NSBH merger, where there won't be a blue component, but there may be a bright red component. And radio, you know, the radio observations will have a role to play, we hope, in every event. But we want to make sure we adapt our strategy to match uh, what we'll see. Uh, with that in mind, we've developed a, a, a multi-tier strategy that we've used uh, over the last couple of years. For example, we've been doing a technique called on-the-fly mapping, where we map the entire area. That's been used only for the case of the BH-BH mergers because we don't expect any uh, contextual information from, um, from optical surveys. Um, <clears throat> what was already mentioned earlier on by Elena, for example, is that a really good strategy is to, ta is to target galaxies in the volume. So in scenarios, for example, where we don't, we don't and we hope, in the, in the radio case, we really, really, really hope you find an optical counterpart that makes our life a lot easier. But if you don't, we have a strategy where we will target galaxies. Uh, looking for a radio afterglow evolving on weeks to month timescales. And in the best case scenario, we have a, uh, a radio follow-up of a detected optical or IR counterpart. Uh, and the radio adds, adds a lot of important information on whether or not there's a cocoon or a jet present. And of course, about the dynamical ejecta and the density of the ISM surrounding the event. There are some scenarios which may be very exciting. If, for example, you have a total chirp mass, where it's a, it's, a, it's a bit ambiguous whether you've got an NS, uh, uh, a high mass and a NS binary or whether you may have an NSBH binary, uh, the nature of the afterglow will be very different potentially. And in that scenario, uh, we would invest a lot of time trying to find a radio afterglow if there was no optical counterpart because that additional information about the, the galaxy and about the nature of the afterglow may be what you, what's required to actually establish the nature of the actual merger itself. OK, the last thing I want to talk about briefly is uh, um, another possible uh, more, more highly speculative counterpart that you, you may see for NS mergers. And that's the case of a prompt or even precursor low frequency prompt burst of radio emission. And this has been, there's been lots of physical models put forward that are highly speculative that there may be a, a low frequency bright radio afterglow observed uh, for certain uh, NS mergers. Um, I actually did lead, a, lead a, a project called the Avro LWA, which is an array that's designed to image the entire sky every 10 seconds. And when it's finished, it will have a, a 352 antennas across 2.5 kilometers. Uh, uh, it spans 25 to 85 megahertz in frequency, so very low frequency, where the models predict you'll have a burst of radio emission. Uh, we do full cross correlation of every dipole to image the entire sky continuously, which is horribly data intensive, but it means that we for about half the events we should be watching when they happen. Um, and it's, I think it's the most powerful array operation below 100 megahertz. Uh, here's just a, a, an obligatory drone movie in the center of the array. Uh, the array, when it's finished, will span two and a half kilometers. Here is the central 200 meters with some graduate students for scale. Uh, you've got, uh, in that inner core, you've got two, five, six of these dual polarization dipole antennas. And you've got uh, 88 kilometers of uh, cable and optical fiber buried below the ground, bringing it all back home to process. So um, 
What we hope to do is take an image of the entire sky every 10 seconds. Here's an example of what you would see in the optical. This is not a radio image. But just to, get, to adjust your, your eyes to what a north, south, east, west uh, image of the entire sky looks like. Uh, here now is a movie of three hours with the Avro LWA. But it's not just a random three hours. Uh, well, this is an image first. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it with the lights on. But uh, this is the entire sky at radio wavelengths. This is a, a single 10 second snapshot. Uh, north, south, east, and west. And it, it's a, <coughs> an observation we did trying to kind of prepare for the GW events. It's actually a, a, a three hour observation uh, for a swift detected GRB. About halfway through this observation, a GRB occurred. And we checked uh, for radio flux density at the location of that event. You can see things like airplanes flying overhead and meteors and all kinds of uh, uh, transient stuff. There are about 10,000 sources in every 10 second image. When we finished the array, it'd be more like 50,000. And we built it. One of the main reasons we built this is to try and find this low frequency prompt emission. Here's the, the, the frame where the uh, short GRB, this is the, the frame coincident with the short GRB. So we run a buffer, and whenever a trigger comes in from Swift, we dump the buffer, we image, and we look for a counterpart. In this case, unfortunately, there was no counterpart. Uh, here's the dynamic spectrum showing the, where we look for this you know, pulse emission. Of course, the NS merger population found by LIGO will be much closer. And we hope, in fact, if, we, if we'd been observing when GW170817 happened, we would have enough sensitivity to rule out most models, most, most of these, the, these uh, previously predicted models for emission. Unfortunately, we only cover half the sky, and it was the half of the sky where uh, the merger wasn't happening. This is an image from 12 hours before the merger. And this is the error region uh, from the three detector uh, limit from, from GW. So hopefully, going forward, we'll be able to do a lot better and get, you know, try and get an NS merger in the near universe and get it simultaneous. All right, in summary, radio observations of GW170817 are ongoing and have proved very important in understanding the nature uh, uh, of, and morphology uh, of the outflow. Uh, the radio only spectrum is consistent with common origin for radio and x ray. Light curve today favors a wide angle outflow. Uh, more and there's more energy in the slower moving ejecta. Uh, VLBI and or polarization measurements will possibly distinguish between co the cocoon and dynamic ejecta, high velocity tail, and also the possibility of whether or not there, there may have been a, uh, an off-axis gamma ray burst seen somewhere in the universe. And uh, of course, the bulk of the ejecta is traveling at slower velocities. And we, as we expect, it will rise on time scales of you know, maybe a year or two. Uh, so a lot more, there's a lot more to do still with this one event, uh, even though we've lots more coming down the pipe from 03 soon, we hope. And future searches for low frequency prompt bursts is now possible. I think will be an exciting thing to try and do uh, in 03. OK, thank you very much. Here yeah, we have time for a few questions. Could, Greg, could you say a little bit more about the prospects for doing polarimetry? Right. And um, yeah, how realistic is it in this source? Uh, very realistic. In fact, I hope to, we'll, we'll do it in the next week or two. Week or two. Uh, with the VLA, you can routinely get to 0.1% polarization. Um, it requires <coughs> how you calibrate polarization. It's all about separating the instrument and polarization from sky polar polarization. <coughs> um, observations to date did not include you know, you, if you want to calibrate the VLA's polarization, the easiest way to do it is to observe an unpolarized source. And that gives you the leakage term. And, and uh, yeah. then you observe a, a source with no polarization angle, and you have the full uh, 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 source parameters characterized. We just never bothered including that one unpolarized source. You could, uh. you could actually still do it with, 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 da with, with data to date by actually looking at the variation of yeah. uh, source polarization angles across the sky. But, the best way to do it is have a, a season on polarized source, and uh, we are doing one hopefully in the next two weeks. It's a bit of a long shot, but is circular included in that? Yeah. So the VLA is natively circular, so it's very easy, yeah. and you get it for free. It is. But you, you are doing it though. It is being done. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, and then another totally different question: What is the positional accuracy of the LWA for the sort of uh, uh, quick look that you proposed? Yeah. When, when when we build the last 64 antennas, the resolution will be about five arc minutes. You can get further astrometry um, by super resolving with that. Now, the only thing you have to worry about is the refractive offset of the ionosphere. But I think sub arc minute would be very routine. And if, if, especially if there's a precursor burst, well, that would be so exciting to kind of 
feed that into the LIGO network. So I, I'm very excited about the possibility. And I hope to be able to do, like our native time resolution is 10 seconds, but if I even had 30 seconds of, of notice from LIGO, I could do millisecond uh, 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 searches in the direction of the event. So I really hope that LIGO's uh, uh, trigger times become much improved. Not that I'm complaining about O2, it was great to get what we got. <laughs> You have in here the power law of how the energy is coupled as a function of speed of the ejecta. Right. Does this tell you anything about the nature of what's you know accelerating this material? I mean, I thought for like a pure explosion, it was actually significantly shallower than this, and that you would expect more uh, energy coupled to to high velocity ejecta. Well, uh, the interesting thing was this: this when, when the two D simulations that that Gullivar did made a prediction that was essentially this, this shallow. So I think Speed's going to cover this tomorrow in detail in the, in the radio to x-ray to gamma ray, you know, global picture of the model. In a nutshell, in a nutshell I can say that uh, the, this is exactly the numbers we get from modeling uh, independently. But uh, the problem is that um, we have here a single function, which you, you, from the data, from the radio data, or from the X-ray data, from, the, from this late emission data, you can measure a single function, which is the energy as a function of velocity. And this single function can be convolution of various distributions, because the energy can, distribution can be radial, or it can be angular. And as things slow down, you see things on the side. So, um, you can, it's clearly, it's clear that this data on its own cannot distinguish between very, dif between different models because you have a function of single variable which is in principle fitted, can be, f is derivative or results from a, from a function of two variables. So, so there are many, in principle there are many models that can fit this. Uh, the question is whether there is a physical model. I mean, if you, if you just cook an <coughs> ad hoc model, there are many that can do. The question is, is there any physical mo physically motivated model that gives you just the observed distribution? And tomorrow I'll try to discuss uh, such a model. Yeah, that's what mentioning that, yeah, a, a cocoon is just one type of structure, Jesh, but it's a physically motivated uh, model for, for what you might, might expect to see structure. Yeah. 